Hello and welcome to Business 360. I'm Shireen Bhan. The headlines that we're tracking for you this evening. There's been a late recovery on the Lal Street. The Nifty ends above 20,000 for the first time. Mid caps and small caps recoup some of the losses after yesterday's sharp fall. Crude prices hit a 10-month high. Floods in Libya, maintenance work in Kazakhstan impact output, stoking fears of supply disruption. Last week, Saudi Arabia and Russia had announced that they would extend voluntary production cuts to end of the year. We, we are delighted with our business in India. It's, it's, it's a very strong business. Standard Chartered CEO Bill Winter says India is welcoming to long-term foreign players and international investors are keen on tapping into the consumer market and the tech opportunity revealed Standard Chart has taken big losses in China and the stimulus is not lifting the Chinese market yet. Also adds China's financial system remains strong. Tech major Oracle's shares suffer the worst single-day drop in over two decades. Weakness in the cloud business spooks investors as it is the fastest growing segment for Indian IT companies. VPCO Bernard Looney resigns less than four years since he took over. Looney, the company says Looney was not fully transparent about his past personal relationships with colleagues. North Korean leader Kim Jong-un mids Vladimir Putin in Russia's Amur region vows to give Moscow full and unconditional support towards what he calls Russia's sacred fight to defend its interests. The leaders hold talks on a possible military cooperation. Apple unveils a Series 9 watch, calling it the first carbon neutral product from its table. Also launches the iPhone 15 lineup with a USB-C port and an improved camera system. Apple shares traded in the red soon after the announcement came in. All of that coming up for you, but straight to the day's market action. The markets did recover today from their intraday lows, ended higher than Nifty, ending above 20,000 for the first time ever. The recovery was led by financials. PSU Bank Index, in fact, hitting a record high today. So that's the Nifty for you, up over 20,000. The PSU Bank Index, as we pointed out, higher by about 200 points. Uh, and the Nifty Mid Cap also recouping some of the losses that we saw. It was hit by yesterday, so closing in the green, but just about uh, remember, it was pummeled yesterday. Meanwhile, Tata Group's market capitalization surpassing 25 lakh crore rupees. That was one of the big stories for the market. So what sparked this roller coaster ride that we are seeing in mid caps and small caps over the last couple of days? There was speculation and unconfirmed reports on the liquidation by a large fund. The fund manager in question has denied the allegations allegedly in a LinkedIn post and threatened to take legal action as well. Nimesh joins us now with more on the dealing room chatter. Uh, Nimesha, uh, you know, the FII data certainly doesn't seem to suggest that there are any alarm bells on a possible liquidation event by a hedge fund. What are you picking up? Indeed, a sharp recovery for the markets, and that was led by financials and the pharma stocks. But within financials, it was a PSU bank stock, which had a huge move and, 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 and back of very strong buying traction as well. So the PSU bank index ended more than 3% higher. But the bigger story was the recovery in the mid-cap and small-cap. There was a sharp sell-off yesterday on the back of that unconfirmed reports of a liquidation by a leading hedge fund. In fact, the fund manager under question today actually denied all the allegations and threatened legal action as well. Sources tell us that uh, the, uh, the particular fund had a very small exposure in the broader market. In fact, the total size is not more than $300 million uh, as far as the mid-cap and small-cap exposure in India. And given that there is a, such a strong uh, domestic flow, we saw a sharp recovery in today's trade. A lot of the stocks have recovered from yesterday's fall and it looks like that big scare of a hedge fund liquidation seems to be at least done and dusted for the time being. Back to you. Well, that seems to be the case, but we will have to wait to see. There is no official confirmation that's come in from the hedge fund in question or from the market regulator. CNBC TV 18 has reached out to both for comment. Crude prices hovering around a 10-month high after supply fears spooked the markets. Prices up 2% overnight, largely driven by temporary supply disruption caused by Libya, which has been hit by deadly storms triggering floods. Last week, Saudi Arabia and Russia had announced that they would extend voluntary production cuts to the end of the year, and all of that has impacted crude prices now trading above $90 a barrel. 
Back home, the Reserve Bank has removed the 90-day ceiling on the holding period for securities held by banks under the held for trading category. Now, this is part of its revised guidelines on categorizing investments by banks. The central bank has also removed the ceiling on the held to maturity category in the lender's investment portfolio. The revised guidelines will come into effect from the 1st of April 2024, so still some time away. Now, the RBI has also moved to safeguard the rights of borrowers and streamline the lending process. The central bank has issued a new directive to all all lenders on personal loans, so all regulated entities, including banks, NBFCs, ARCs and others, must release original movable and immovable property documents within 30 days of full repayment or settlement of loans. The failure to do so could result in a penalty of 5,000 rupees per day. So borrowers can collect these documents from the banking outlet or any other office of the registered entity. That's the latest that's coming from the RBI. Global tech major Oracle's shares suffered its deepest single-day drop in over two decades last night. And this after the cloud service provider reported slowing cloud sales and weak revenue guidance for the quarter. The company's revenue growth of 30% also declined sequentially. Rima is standing by to take us through what went wrong with Oracle and the possible impact on Indian IT. Rima. Thanks so much for that. So Oracle Corp, the U.S. listed company, stock price declined by 13.5% in yesterday's uh, trade on the back of disappointing numbers. In fact, this was the single biggest fall for Oracle Corp share price uh, since March of 2002. The reason for the disappointment for Oracle Corp is that the cloud revenues have slowed down. The cloud revenues for Oracle grew by 30%, which compares with a 54% growth in the prior quarter. Basically, cloud revenues are slowing down. Now, this has a negative read-through for the Indian IT companies because Indian IT companies get revenue uh, from the cloud segment. In fact, the cloud segment has been the fastest growing segment for the Indian IT companies. What do these companies, the likes of TCS and Forces, uh, they help their clients migrate to the cloud and build apps and products on the cloud. Uh, so if cloud itself is slowing down, there could be a negative impact on the Indian IT companies. That said, uh, you know, the list companies here uh, have a greater dependence on cloud services companies like Alphabet, Azure, AWS compared to Oracle. But still, it's read by the market as a sign, as a signal that maybe cloud revenues are just slowing down after the hectic, frenetic uh, growth rates of you know the COVID period. And that is a bit of a worrying sign for the Indian companies. Rima, many thanks for joining us. Now, BPCO Bernard Looney has tendered his resignation with immediate effect. This comes less than four years since he took over his position. The company said that Looney did not fully disclose his past personal relationships with his employees. The company's chief financial officer will take over the role of interim CEO. That's the latest at BP. The big newsmaker this evening, Standard Chartered, is upbeat on its India business. In an exclusive conversation with CNBC TV 18, Standard Chartered's global CEO Bill Winter says that India is welcoming to long-term foreign players who make strong local commitment and international investors who are keen on tapping into the consumer market as well as the tech opportunity. He also said that the bank has taken losses in China and the stimulus is not lifting the Chinese market just yet. However, he did add that China's financial system remains strong. Take a look. We, we are delighted with our business in India. It's, it's, it's a very strong business. Uh, we have a very strong corporate business uh, serving uh, both large Indian corporations who, very importantly, are investing increasingly into India. Uh, that wasn't always the case. Mm. Some of the big Indian groups were as inclined to invest outside as inside. That's changed. And, and resources are coming back into this super fast-growing economy. We're very happy to support that. I think we have a big market share uh, with those companies. The international companies are also stepping up their investment in India. Now, you can look at FDI statistics from month to month and, and, mm. and see a very uh, erratic story. But every indication we have is that international investors are very keen to tap into the Indian consumer market, to the Indian infrastructure development, to Indian technology uh, by investing in the country. The fact that India is just in the right place in terms of, of its uh, embracing of technology at a time when that's, that's a distinguishing characteristic. And India has been quite welcoming to long-term foreign players, if I, if I can call us a foreign bank, mm. uh, but who have made a strong local commitment. The biggest losses that we've taken are in Chinese commercial real estate. Um, but the market seems to have broadly stabilized. The stimulus packages are, uh, are having an effect, but it's not lifting the market back up. So, uh, but the financial system in China is still very strong, so that there's no concern that this is spilling over to the banking sector or... Mm. 
or you know, the Chinese have also done a very good job of reining in the non-bank mm. sector. So, so uh, I'd say the jury's out on how long it will take for China to get back to its potential growth rate uh, and where the growth will go from there. But uh, they're managing things quite directly, and I would say so far so good. You can catch that full interview with Bill Winters. The Global CEO Standard Chartered at 5 p.m. and 9.30 p.m. right here on CNBC TV 18. Well, here's the latest in the legal battle between SEBI and Z's promoter, Puneet Goenka. The market regulator has raised concerns over transactions between Z and SL entities at the hearing at the Securities Appellate Tribunal. SEBI argued that there are, and I quote, significant red flags and the transaction cannot be genuine or a coincidence. SEBI called on Z to present evidence to prove the transactions were genuine. The tribunal will resume hearing the matter tomorrow. EdTech Unicorn Baiju's has been accused by its lenders of hiding $533 million in a little-known hedge fund. This, as per Bloomberg report, the hedge fund once listed its principal business address as a Miami IHOP pancake restaurant. Baiju's has denied the allegation and said that it is not party to the Florida court proceedings and was not served with the copies of the lawsuit. In a statement, Baiju's added that the lender's application for information on the $500 million, part of which was received by Baiju's Alpha, was rejected. Dengue cases have risen in several states across Bihar, Karnataka and Uttar Pradesh, seeing an unusual spike. Karnataka has reported over 7,000 cases in the last few days. Of these, more than 4,000 cases are from Bengaluru alone. Meanwhile, cases have crossed the 900 mark in Bihar, with a significant portion recorded in just the first 10 days of September. The U.S. Drug Regulators Independent Advisory Committee has declared phenylephrine, a commonly used ingredient in over-the-counter cough and cold medicines, as ineffective. Experts do not expect a knee-jerk reaction, though, because the FDA panel has not pointed out safety concerns. Also, the alternates to the ingredients might be limited. Rescue operations continue in Morocco five days after the 6.8 magnitude earthquake hit the country. According to state media, the death toll from the quake has risen to 2,900. The number of people injured has doubled to over 5,500. UNICEF has said over one lakh children have been impacted by the earthquake. And the death toll in the Libya floods has risen to 6,000 as per local media reports. Thousands are reportedly missing. The flood triggered by a powerful storm on Sunday swept away a quarter of the city of Derna. Several countries, including the U.S., Germany, Iran, Italy and Turkey, have already rushed aid to Libya. North Korea's leader Kim Jong-un has vowed full and unconditional support to President Putin in what he terms is Russia's sacred fight. The two leaders met in Russia. Reports suggest that discussions on an arms deal has taken place. Kim Jong-un has deemed North Korea's relationship with Russia as the first priority for the country. Now, a district court in Washington has begun hearing what is the most significant challenge to the power of big tech in decades. The U.S. government is taking Google to court for monopoly. This is the online search industry's dynamics that we're talking about here. Prashant is standing by now to explain why this landmark case could shape the future of the tech industry and of Silicon Valley. Uh, Prashant, this is a big one. Explain to us the implications of this court battle. Uh, you know, Shireen, thanks very much for that. I may be exaggerating a bit here, but I guess not by too much when I say uh, that this is being seen as a very consequential trial with respect to uh, big, tech, big tech power in the modern era. Let me quickly tell you what has really happened. Now, the U.S. Department of Justice and attorney generals of 38 U.S. states are alleging that Google maintains its monopoly power in the search and search advertising market through a set of exclusive contracts that make Google the default search engine on a range of products in exchange for a share of the advertising revenue generated by Google searches. Now, uh, what are these exclusive contracts? Uh, to give you an example, these are contracts with uh, web browser developers, uh, most notably Apple and Mozilla, original equipment manufacturers like Samsung, and wireless uh, carriers like Verizon who sell Android devices. So how much does Google pay these companies, uh, uh, you know, which are on the other side as part of this, uh, in a way, quid pro quo? JP Morgan analysts estimate that Google will pay out nearly $30 billion to search distribution partners this year in 2023, which is about 17% of Google's search and other gross revenue. You must be wondering what is wrong in all of this? Well, U.S. regulators are essentially arguing, the government is arguing, that Google's alleged exclusive dealing arrangements violate Section 2 of the Sherman Act, 
which makes it unlawful for a person to monopolize or attempt to monopolize or combine or conspire with any other person or persons to monopolize any part of the trade or commerce. Well, uh, how will this be settled? Broadly, there are two outcomes which many are watching out for. One is uh, status quo, nothing changes, right? So that would be a win for Google. On the other hand, it's possible that Google loses th these search distribution deals. Analysts point to the second outcome as a potential blow because this, the second outcome, then, then introduces the risk that a competitor like, for example, Microsoft's Bing could become the default search partner on provider on platforms where Google right now is the default today. There is, of course, also the chance that Apple could develop or acquire its own search engine. How long could this trial sort of last and when will we know the outcome? Using historical context in an earlier example, the U.S. Department of Justice versus Microsoft case went on for more than three years. The trial began in May of 1998 and the settlement only came through in 2001. In any case, I think this will be a case which will be, as you said, very closely watched to assess the sometimes uneasy equation that big tech around the world shares with governments around the world. Back to you. Prashant, many thanks for watching. Uh, many thanks for joining us. Yes, we will be watching very closely. And as Prashant was pointing out, uh, you know, it's not like a judgment is expected anytime soon, but certainly the proceedings will be watched closely. American big tech and AI experts will meet U.S. senators to brief them on the advancement of artificial intelligence in the industry. And this will be the first bipartisan Senate forum on AI to help Congress formulate and implement regulations. Tech companies around the world have been calling for AI regulations for some time now. CNBC's Emily Wilkins is here with the details. Emily, what can we expect? This is really meant to be a general education session, which kind of sounds like it's a no big deal, but this is a very big deal. Tech giants are heading to Capitol Hill today for really what is a one-of-a-kind meeting on AI. All 100 senators have been invited to attend the all-day forum to hear from Mark Zuckerberg, Elon Musk, Sam Altman, Bill Gates, and a number of other CEOs from tech companies, plus leaders from unions as well as civil rights groups. Now, the whole point of the gathering, as mentioned, is to educate senators on AI. You know that it's lawmakers, it's not usually the most tech-savvy group, but lawmakers understand that they really want to focus and prioritize AI legislation. The three-hour session that will begin at 10 a.m. will focus on technology, and then an afternoon session will focus on policy. Yet, the real world work is going on in a handful of committees that are forming legislation on AI. Both the Senate Judiciary and Commerce Committees held hearings yesterday. Democrat Richard Blumenthal and Republican Josh Hawley held one of those hearings on their framework for AI. That includes creating an independent oversight body that AI companies would need to register with. And other pieces of the framework would include limiting China and Russia's ability to access U.S. technology, plus letting consumers know when they're seeing or interacting with AI. There should be oversight by an independent agency of, say, the, the most advanced models at the same time that other agencies are also responsible for how applications use AI. For example, to decide whether you're, you and I are going to get a loan or a mortgage for our house. I'm terrified of the arms race. I honestly, I don't say that lightly. If, if governments worked on that, I know the UK AI summit is happening soon, and that is a critical, um, I think, convening moment to try to create multilateral agreement about the risks so that we can coordinate the race to a more reasonable pace. While well, tech CEOs head there to Capitol Hill to talk about possible AI regulations. Apple's flagship event, Wanderlust, unveiled the latest iPhone 15 models and a Series 9 Apple Watch. The much-awaited products will be available from the 22nd of September. This will be the first iPhone launch after Apple ordered its official stores in Delhi and Mumbai. Shibani joins us now with more. Shibani, take us to the key features of the latest offerings. Now, Apple, during its annual Wonderlust event, launched a series uh, of upgrades for its iPhone 15 series. Let's first begin with the iPhone 15 and 15 Plus. Now, both of these devices will feature Dynamic Island, which we saw on the Pro variants last year. Along with that, there is, of course, a better display that you will get on the base variants of, uh, you know, the 15 series, which is the 15 and 15 Plus. Apart from that, there is an improved camera system with 
a 48 megapixel main camera a 12 megapixel telephoto and better portrait mode they also come in new colors the base variants come in new colors including a beautiful pink looking color that we saw during the launch event now 15 will start at 79900 rupees now let's speak about the pro variant now iphone 15 pro and pro max the price of uh, 15 pro will start at 1 lakh 34 900 rupees and the pro max which is a 6.7 inch uh, pro variant of the device will start at 59900 rupees now both these devices are powered by a very powerful a17 pro chipset which apple claims is uh, or will make uh, this device the fastest among smartphones can even challenge high end pcs is what apple claims now both the pro variants will come in titanium housing which apple claims will make the devices much lighter and more durable now all of these four devices for the first time will have a type c usb type c connector where apple is ditching its uh, you know lightning port for the first time this year now along with the phones uh, in fact apple during its launch event also launched the apple watch series 9 and apple watch ultra 2 now one of the most interesting features of these two apple watches is the double tap feature uh you know with the tap of uh, you know your four finger and your thumb uh, you can uh, do series and a couple of things including launching widgets or taking receiving or uh, disconnecting calls and more without having to touch uh, your watch now apple watch series 9 will in fact start at 41900 whereas ultra 2 is priced at 89900 rupees All right, Shivani. Many thanks for joining us. That's the latest there from the Apple stable. And with that, it is time for us to wrap up this edition of Business 360. Thanks very much for watching. Do stay tuned. News will continue here on CNBC TV 18.